so welcome. Thanks for thanks for having me. Um, uh, yeah, it's nice to nice to sit with you. So this is a, a, a from a, a talk that uh, Michelle McDonald gave, and she's describing this interaction with, I, I think it's her great niece. And, um, and Michelle has a, is a meditation teacher in Hawaii and teaches a long-term uh, teacher at IMS. And she uh, has a bad back. And so the way that she described picking up her, her uh, niece was that her niece would run and jump onto Michelle's back, yeah? Because the gesture of actually lifting was too much, but if she jumped, it was okay, yeah? So this is um, this is Michelle. So uh, she, the the great niece, uh, Brenna, is a little over 50 pounds. I don't really have the ability to lift her up. She's running towards me, and I don't see the backpack on her. Just to let you know, also, to set the stage, it was pouring rain and really cold out, really pouring rain. And we were right at the doorway to leave the school, and there were a lot of parents and kids running around. And she's running at me, and I say, jump. And I pick her up, and I'm like, wow. I always think I can do anything. Carrying her out, I open the door and I have a moment, and it's not a moment of willingness. I feel that cold air and I want my hood on, so I say, Brenna, why don't you put my hood on so I don't get cold? She puts my hood on and she puts it on over my eyes like a kid will do. So I'm like, uh oh. <laughs> And I go out uh, and I get outside and I don't know that the step is a gradual step and I start to take this fall. And you know how everything slows down when you're taking a fall. The difference between everything going fine and everything not going fine is so thin. This is a Nietzsche. So I start to slip and I really fell, swirling around and we both fell. I got a pretty good scrape, I ripped my favorite pants. But what was worse was that I was worried she was gonna be embarrassed. I was going for this fall and I could feel all the places in her mind uh, she was going to go and the worst part was embarrassment. So I decided to just act like nothing really happened. So I just jumped up with her and I said, Brenna, that was a good job. And I really meant it. And she looked at me like my aunt is nuts. So I took her mind off the embarrassment, but I, then I really praised her and I meant it. If she had torqued, if she hadn't completely flowed with that experience, I would have been in serious trouble. So she just trusted me and went with the fall so beautifully. She didn't get hurt at all. You know how you can protect a kid more than yourself. It was magnificent. Do you relate to your falls like that? Do you relate to the difficult times in practice like that? Is there some voice in the, you that says, wow, you did a really good job with that fall, yeah? So maybe 15 years ago, I was uh, sitting a retreat uh, with Shinzen Young, and um, we were in a, a, a kind of part of the retreat. There's a guided meditation followed by some dialogue and um, and somebody gave like a very, a great report, you know, like how her meditation was going. And it was like glowing, yeah. And as I'm like listening, to, and it was a, I think a two week retreat, and as I'm listening to this and I'm just hearing 
how well things are going, my heart is sinking, you know, like just unadulterated envy, yeah. <laughs> and I really, I, you know, there was no, no sense of mudita, of sympathetic joy, of like uh, delighting in the spiritual flourishing of my fellow yogi, you know. It was just like, like the the comparing mind was so uh, was just the only thing in consciousness really, and um, and that was a function of the fact that um, there was there was this kind of longing for the Dharma, longing to understand my mind, to know what was possible, to know how um, deeply the heart could rest how expansive the mind could be. There was, there was a very sincere wish for that, but it was all bound up with a lot of egoic clinging, yeah? Where I was, I was trying to turn myself into this spiritual being and in a certain way, anyone else's experience was a potential threat, yeah? And that's just the folly and the agony of the comparing mind. And so, um, the kind of envy that is, of that moment, um, it really is, um, like everything in our practice, it's teaching us, yeah? In the sense that, that the envy uh, highlights the architecture of self-view. Yeah. Like to actually understand the places of clinging, the ways in which I get fixated on who I am and what makes me a value. I, the, the envy is a kind of spotlight on the structure, the architecture of that. And so... Um, so I'm sitting there and it was intense enough that I, I don't usually like raise my hand, but I raised my hand and I, I, I reported on my experience, yeah? And so it was just like, uh, I gave, you know, and I was quite settled and concentrated myself. So I gave like a blow by blow experience of the kind of agonizing comparing mind and envy and all of this. And, um, and so uh, the, the, uh, the teacher said, um, it, with respect to the envy, to that, that, that experience which is arising and passing in real time, his instruction was, um, love that envy to death. Yeah, <laughs> love it to death. So what does that mean, to love it to death? That might well be the mantra of Vipassana practice, actually. Yeah. So elsewhere, Shinzen said, um, said, to have a complete experience is to love something to death and to know it to death, whether it's yourself or any sensory event, big or small, when you love it to death and know it to death, you're too busy experiencing it to make an object out of it. So in a sense, it's not there. But it's not there because you're so busy knowing it, so it's more there. It's both more there and less there than normal human experience. A kind of completeness and a kind of nothingness at exactly the same time. The things that cause us um, pain in this life, we, we generally try to, to hate them to death. Yeah? Like we, we know that experience. And uh, in a certain way, even with our own kind of spiritual evolution or psychological evolution, we're, 
we're repeating that same pattern. And so one of, one of my friends, um, Vinnie Ferraro says like, you can't hate yourself into becoming a better person. Yeah? <laughs> How hard have we tried that one, yeah? <laughs> so in spiritual practice, we want to look at... Um, at how we turn ourselves into a kind of battleground. Um, me versus my ego, me versus my emotions, me, the spiritual self versus my animal self. And uh, this dynamic of, of hating something to death, it arises in a lot of different ways and we turn awareness into this kind of battleground, but awareness has no enemies. There are no enemies in experience. And so we're actually moving the heart mind in the direction of, of loving, loving it to death. So I would hear, of course, you know, Matthew, you don't need to do, like, you don't need to practice in this way. You don't need to, to turn your inner life into this kind of battleground and um, allow the clinging to kind of um, flavor the trajectory of practice. And I would hear that, but I really wouldn't totally believe it, you know. Like, I kind of believe it but there was a part of me that just um, felt like uh, somehow unless I was doing some kind of battle spiritual practice wasn't advancing yeah so um, we have to learn these lessons in our own time we have to kind of we cling and suffer our way into freedom, yeah? So, uh, some of what we're, we're learning to do in this uh, is, is to develop a certain kind of uh, grace and patience and wisdom with respect to the peaks and valleys of spiritual life. Yeah. And this is most evident on retreat, on silent intensive retreat, but it, it can be discerned in our ordinary daily life, the peaks and valleys of practice. And it feels so much like the peaks are the point, yeah? The peaks are the point of practice. But the truth is that the peaks and the valleys and the ascent and the descent are the point of practice, yeah? That takes a long time to trust, yeah. And I'm so familiar with that feeling of the descent, yeah. Where there's some peace or clarity or goodness or love or the mind is open, life feels complete, nothing's left out. And then there's this slow decay of the mindfulness. Yeah, the descent begins and it's like, no, please, no. And we like scramble and grapple and try to claw our way back up that descent even as our like fingernails are like, making marks down the side of the mountain, you know. And it's like, there's no way this is the point of practice. There's no way 
That's the point. Yeah? That's the point of practice. But it's not. Each each point on that kind of roller coaster ride of peak and valley and descent and ascent, each each place on there has something to offer the heart. Yeah. We we have to actually um, open in a certain way to learn from every place along that continuum. Now, sometimes uh, nothing we do works. Yeah, it's like we do everything we can to reestablish a certain balance or to open in some way to um, be nourished by this particular moment of practice and nothing, it feels like nothing is working, yeah. And um, that too, of course, is a, a Dharma experience. Namely, the experience of uh, helplessness, which we miss. We we miss that, like we miss the moment. Oh, this is what helplessness feels like. Yeah. And in the pantheon of like most aversive human experiences, there are. That's up there. Yeah. And sometimes we won't have the energy to do it, but the in the the kind of learning on offer in those moments is to actually um, for the heart to be softened, humbled in a more radical way. Nothing's working. Yeah. And a kind of um, a deeper love can grow out of this. Yeah, when the ego's like all out of moves. Sazajan Sajito. Um, many people have acceptance issues, sometimes very strong, but I would suggest that we all have acceptance issues. I have acceptance issues. Being a self is extremely busy, to my mind, uncomfortable. And you really have to cultivate this intentionality above all, just to have the deep, loving acceptance of the mess of it all. Without taking it that this is something wrong with you especially, we're all in the mess on the self level. Some of us are better at handling it than others. Some of us less deeply, tragically wounded by it. But we're all in that slightly fragile state. And there's a sense of real loving acceptance. This is about as open as you can be right now. Okay, that's fine. This is about as grounded as you can be right now. This is about as quiet as you can be right now. Just keep sensing that quality of caring and loving. These resonances do keep washing through and they begin to reassure and calm. And we find, ah, here's the ground. The ground is in the quality of loving acceptance, not in myself or my strategies, but in the loving acceptance of myself and my strategies. The model of practice of, uh, in this, this world of mindfulness of Vipassana, or as I've been alluding to these cycles, uh, Michelle uses the language of like purity and purification. Yeah? peaks and then and then there's some kind of descent and 
in a way it's it's the peak, it's the clarity, it's the openness, it's the love that actually makes more room for what is unresolved in the heart to arise. And there's this kind of rhythm through which we we kind of spiral down or up, you know, um, with uh, developing grace with the, what the moment, what practice looks like now. What does practice look like now? And we have so many reference points of what, well, what that looked like last sit or yesterday or last year or the last breath. But instead, we're actually developing this this kind of commitment to just learning, being softened by life, no matter what is arising. And uh, this process of spiraling, it like keeps going until we're more and more free. Yeah, until there's less and less that can kind of... um, ambush the heart-mind. And in this process, um, of course, to love it to death, this is about, um, this is about love. Yeah? Love in in the spirit of like Martin Luther King's is sort of like a um, spirit of nonviolence directed inwards too, yeah. And so in a way we're, we're investing love, we're beginning with love and growing love in the process. Jessamine Ward said, uh, a spiritual awakening which does not awaken the sleeper to love has aroused them in vain. And love is, is said to be the kind of glue of the world. Yeah. Like sometimes you're just reflecting on like, like what it's like in the absence of love the ways things disintegrate and fracture and uh, harm is done. And so love is is said to be the kind of glue of the world. And so to love something to death is, um, it's not necessarily to like it. Yeah. We usually think about there's like hating and liking and really like liking and then we get to love. And it's all on the same spectrum, yeah? But we're not actually trying to re-engineer our preferences. What you like and what you dislike is, is um, that's not a, battle you want to pick exactly yeah that's deep but we can not like something but love it yeah we can not like the descent uh, into some new phase of purification in practice but we can love it yeah and this actually generates um this is a kind of the indirect path to love. Yeah, like to, to open with equanimity to difficulty. The kind of byproduct of that is more and more love. Um, so what, what do we love to death? We love uh, certain habits to death. Yeah. So we see we're getting caught in some way. We want to do something the same way we always do. We want to tell ourselves the same story. We want to act out the same pattern. 
and just the willingness to stay is the beginning of the, the transformation of a habit. Yeah. The directive, the kind of order from the habit is to do something and we just stay. And that requires a kind of patience with like this unfurling of a kind of tightly bound wire in our own body, mind. It it usually means a kind of developing some equanimity with, with feeling. Because the, the habit it kind of blackmails us into action and its, its trump card is feeling. Yeah. And so we're actually learning just to stay. That's how we begin to love a habit to death. We love our past to death. Ellie, Ellie Wiesel um, from kind of uh, recollections of of, um, of the Holocaust surviving, but the, much of his family uh, dying. Um, wrote um, in the end, it is all about memory, its sources and its magnitude. And of course, its consequences. In some ways, the the present moment is composed of the past, the totality of the past. We sit down and we all we talk about being present, but to be present in a certain sense is to have equanimity with the past. To make room in the heart for all of the kind of karmic streams to enter into this moment and to bless them with awareness. And so there's an important sense in which Practice is this kind of transformation of the past, a transformation of the momentum of the past, and a way in which we come to a deeper sense of completion with the past. So um, psychiatrist Irvin Yalom said something like, uh, I think he described... um, uh, therapeutic success as giving up hope for a better past, yeah? <laughs> Which is a good line. Uh, but there's another way in which the past is, is, oh, is, is not accessed but constructed and reconstructed. It's not like we reach into this file drawer and we like there there are these like perfectly encoded memories yeah in a certain way um how memory gets encoded is a function of our delusion in that moment yeah how we construe things and then how we reconstruct our past in part is a function of the the level of delusion in the moment that we actually were not able to see that experience with the Dharma eye. That we perceived it to some extent through the prism of the kilesas of greed, hatred, delusion. And what this means is that um, I, it, it often feels like memory gets, it gets certain, like a certain way in which it's locked in at that particular level of development in our own wisdom and love. Yeah. 
And so there's this aspect of practice as we begin to actually bless our past with wisdom and love. That we are, there's this sense of the past is actually being transformed. Philip Roth said, um, uh, we don't just forget things because they don't matter, but we also forget things because they matter too much. Each of us remembers and forgets in a pattern whose labyrinthine windings are an identification mark no less distinctive than a fingerprint. We acclimatize to our autobiography, this, this story we've told and retold. And it, it's so much like the water that we swim in that sometimes even just a glimpse, even just a, like a sense of that opening can be liberating in some way. Just a sense of like becoming a little bit unconvinced by your autobiography. Yeah? Becoming a little bit more mysterious to yourself. Yeah. And Dharma practice is a way in which we, we do, we come to be slightly alienated from our autobiographies and to actually begin to love our past to death. And in that process, yeah, the sense of who we are, of where we've come from, of what our past even is, uh, changes. It's like, here we are, we're sitting, trying to mind our own business, <laughs> And there's, there it is. There's that memory. There's that habit. There's that very familiar autobiographical trope. And we love it to death. It's like blessing the past with, with wisdom and love. Yeah. Because we didn't we couldn't have, um, yeah, we misconstrued the memories that like really get lodged in a certain, in, in the heart mind, like they're, they're sort of calling out for our attention. Yeah. They feel, it feels like something undigested in the same way that we eat something and we, we, it's too big a meal for us to digest. Yeah. And our life, in a certain way, has been too big for us to digest. Just because any human life, at times, is more intense than we can handle. Yeah. Just being human, in a sense, is a, is a little bit more intense than we can handle. That, that's the first noble truth. And so we have this, um, things come up, and if we sit enough, if we actually get still and quiet, everything undigested comes up, pleading with us to be loved to death. And so um, we bless uh, we bless all our former selves with the Dharma. Yeah. We forgive uh, forgive all of them. And in this process, we are, you could say, uh, loving the self to death. So 
in Buddhism, so the the self is um, is not uh, it's not a thing, but an experience, a process that arises and passes in the same way that sound arises and passes. And to to love the self to death is to actually see to see what 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 feels like the ground of my being to see that as arising flowing experience yeah. Dan Dennett uh, the philosopher described a self um, as as the center of narrative gravity yeah the center of narrative gravity. And he said like in physics or whatever, there's center of gravity is not an actual point. It's a kind of uh, abstraction. Yeah. Useful for sure, but an abstraction. And he says, and there's something very, um, potent about that description, the sense of self as the center of narrative gravity. It's like the point to which it it feels like the ground of our being, but it's actually experience, anicca, impermanent, but it creates the, when it's not seen with clarity, when it's not loved to death, it creates the sense of being outside of experience, of being a person. And the, the density of self varies dramatically. We start to get more still. We love the self to death. In that moment with the eruption of envy that I began with, it's like, okay, to to love it to death. So there's not just the envy, but there's this elaborate sense of self-making, of autobiographical debris that's getting kicked up in that moment. We love it to death. So in this sense, There's a kind of continuum from self-harshness that moves more and more towards something like self-acceptance, self-love. And then we just like keep loving the self more and more deeply and we know anatta, not self. Self-hatred is a kind of friction and preoccupation. And we like start, okay, how can we love this experience? How can we love this experience, love it to death? And we start to come into, over time, a more kind of uh, gentle relationship with our own self. And the attention gets more precise and more quiet and then the actual components, the experiences that create the sense of I amness, we love that also to death. Yeah. No conflict between loving the self and forgetting the self. So I offer that for your consideration. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs>